Father God, we thank you that we are all gathered here this evening, Lord, not thinking it robbery, Father God, to learn more and more of you. Father God, we just ask that every heart, all eyes and ears be open to your word and what you have to teach us tonight. Lord, we just ask that you bless our facilitator mightily, God, and give her everything she needs to get your word across to these, your people. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if anybody can hear you, Jackie. I cannot hear you. I can't hear either. Neither can I. Well, you might be able to hear me if I unmute my mic. Is that better? All right. All right. Praise God. Praise God. We expect you. Go ahead. Okay. All right. let's, let's see if we can do this again. Good evening again, everybody. Uh, we are beginning Lesson 26 of our Through the Bible in a Year study. And as Pastor Carter said, tonight's lesson is Introduction to the New Testament. And we will actually be talking about what happened between the Old and the New Testament. We know that every Bible student needs to know that there is a gap of over 400 years between the writings of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Many people ask why. Why is there such a gap, especially of 400 years? The answer is simply this. God refused to speak to his people because of their sins. We know that up until this point, God's chosen people had been promised that he would always be with them, that he would never leave them. And we know that just like children do, they were obedient, then disobedient, then obedient, then disobedient. They would cry out to God. He would listen to the, them. He would forgive them and, and restore them, and, and they would get too comfortable. And this cycle just continued over and over again till it got to the point that God decided he would no longer speak to them. Scholarship shows that there were other writings during this period of time, and many of these writings claim to be divinely inspired. In fact, many of the books known as the Apocrypha and the Pseudopigrapha were written during the time between Malachi and Matthew. And for those of you who have your study books, you know that there are quite a few words um, that, that we really have to look at in order to pronounce. And I told Pastor Carter I was going to do a disclaimer at the beginning of the lesson, so I guess this is a good time to do it. I told him I was going to follow the directions that I give my children, my students, when they are reading something and they come across a name they don't know. And I tell them as long as that name does not change the meaning of what you're reading, call it anything. So if you are not able to say apocrypha, and you know that there is a word that starts with an A, and it's not going to change the meaning, just substitute that word. So that's my disclaimer. If I mispronounce any of the words tonight, then it's uh, not intentional. Uh, Pastor Carter says, if I'm not able to say apocrypha, just say apple. Well, it doesn't really, in this case, it will change the meaning. But that's my disclaimer, and we will move on. The Apocrypha is the name that was given to a list of 16 to 20 or more books that the councils rejected as being spiritual based on their doubtful authorship and their contents. Now these books were accepted in the Septuagint, which is the Greek Bible, but rejected by the Protestants as not being canonical, that is, accepted by the Protestant Council of Church Fathers. Eleven of these books are fully accepted by the Roman Catholics and appear in their Bibles. 
These writings were rejected by the councils because they considered the books to have been written and falsely attributed to biblical characters or not having been written as a result of divine revelation. Because we do say that um, God's word, the Bible, was divinely inspired. Now, there are quite a few books um, that are a part of the Apocrypha. And those books are Tobit, Judith, Additions to Esther, 1st Maccabees, 2nd Maccabees, Wisdom, Syrac, Baruch, Letter of Jeremiah, Addition to Daniel, which is Susanna, Song of the Three Children, Baal and the Dragon. There's also 1st uh, Estrus, 2nd Estrus, Prayer of Manasseh, Book of Jubilees, 3rd Maccabees, 4th Maccabees, Psalm 151, Psalms 152 through 155. Now many of the books that I've just mentioned appear in the Roman Catholic Bible, as I said, but they do not appear in Protestant Bibles. And it's because of the aforementioned objectives. Now the Church Fathers at the Council of Nicaea around 325 AD did not believe that the above books were divinely inspired. And there is a second class of contested books that were written before, during, and after the intertestinal period, 400 BC or earlier, until the first century AD and beyond. And these books are called the pseudopigrapha. The term pseudopigrapha refers to the books whose claimed authorship is not verified and whose real authors attributed their works to some biblical character that had lived in a time past. These books are not accepted in the Protestant Bible either, although many secret societies, including the Masonic Order, use some of these books in their rituals and teachings. Christians do need to be made aware of the fact that these books are not scriptural and that they should not regard these books as being scriptural or divinely inspired. We need to know that some of the writers of the Bible quoted from or gave reference to some of the books of both the Apocrypha and the Pseudopigrapha in their writings. Just as we listed some of the books in the um, Apocrypha, there are also books that can be categorized as being books in the Pseudopigrapha. That's 3rd Mac Maccabees, 4th Maccabees, Assumption of Moses, the Book of Enoch 1, the Book of Enoch 2, the Book of Jubilees, the Greek uh, Apocalypse of Baruch, the Letter of Aristeus, Life of Adam and Eve, Martyrdom and Ascension of Isaiah, Psalms of Solomon, Sibylline Oracles, Syriac um, Apocalypse of Baruch, Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, the Gospel of Peter, Second Epistle of Peter, Gospel of Barnas, and Gospel of Judas. And you'll note that some of these are listed in both. Now, um, Pastor Carter, or the author of our Bible workbook, highlighted, chose to highlight the above categories of book in order to alert us as students in the course that there are books out there that many people claim to be additions to the Bible. But the truth of the matter is the fact that the Bible is a divinely inspired book, and there are no additions to it. The truth is also that we should accept that we accept the wisdom of the church councils in the acceptance of the books of the canon and we believe that these councils were moved and guided by the holy spirit and i always say as i was taught uh, by one of my ministers um, that you need to study to show yourself approved and as you study ask for god's guidance and God's voice to speak to you so that you know the truth for yourself because there are so many people who will use the Bible to their own benefit 
take from the Bible, try to even add to the Bible, but as students, biblical students, we have to do our own research. We have to be in the kind of relationship with God so that we know that we know that we know what we read and what we study is divinely appointed. We can therefore conclude that there are no additions to or subtractions from the 66 books that we that were canonized and have become what we know of as the Holy Bible. We as Christians also need to be made aware of the fact that there are no hidden or secret books that God kept out of the Bible and only revealed to a certain person or a select group of people. God did not give a special revelation to um, any of the other uh, religious sects, such as the Mormons or uh, any of the prophets, but God did not reveal his truths to a prophet or any of the other prophets that are not mentioned in the Holy Bible or to anyone else who proposed that they received a deeper and final uh, revelation other than what God breathed into the writers of the Holy Scriptures. And as Christians, we preach the truth of the gospel, and we cast down all vain imaginations, including false teachings, no matter how popular they are or no matter who claims or claim to have received a special revelation from God. Um, the author of our study book also strongly advises students of the gospel to preach and teach the gospel and also be aware of the fact that the enemy of our souls often tries to inject his own books or movies or tapes or CDs or text messages, as well as other forms of communications to throw people off the straight and narrow track. So we have to be diligent about our study, and we have to be alert as we go forth proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, we have to be like Joshua. Well, you say, what does that mean to be like Joshua? If we read the 7th and 8th verses of the first chapter of, jo of Joshua, we find these words. Be strong and brave. Be sure to obey all the teachings my servant Moses gave you. If you follow them exactly, you will be successful in everything you do. Always remember what is written in the book of the teachings. Study it day and night. Then you will be sure to obey everything that is written there. If you do this, you will be wise and successful in everything. And for those of you who are uh, with us for the first time of my teachings, I use the Everyday Bible. So it sounds very different from what you may read if you are reading uh, the KJV or the NIV or perhaps some of the other translations. So what about um, more information concerning what happens between the, test of the New Testament and the Old Testament? What happens during this four year, 400 years of silence? We find that there were several periods that the people experienced, and the first of these being the Persian period. And this refers to the time of the Persian rule after the Jews were returned from exile in Babylon. And it lasted from approximately 430 to 332 BC. The Jews had been captured in 587 BC by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Later, the Babylonians were overthrown by the Persians. Just as the Babylonians influenced the Jews, so did the Persians. The Persians then were overthrown by the Greeks, and this Greek period lasted from 331 to 167 BC. Now during this time, the Jews, just as the rest of the world, were heavily influenced by the Greek culture. And many of us have heard of Alexander the Great. And in 331 BC, at the age of 20, he assumed command of the Greek army. By 331, the entire world lay at his feet. When he invaded Palestine, Palestine in 332, he showed great consideration to the, to the Jews. He spared Jerusalem and offered favors to any Jew who settled in Alexandria, Egypt. Alexander the Great established Greek cities all over his conquered domains. Thus, 
he spread the Greek culture and language. His death occurred in 323 BC. This was followed by the Syrian period. And here we see Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, who was the king of Syria. And he ruled Palestine from 175 to 164 BC. However, unlike the favoritism that Alexander the Great showed, he was violently bitter against the Jews and made a serious attempt to exterminate the Jews and their religion. In 168 BC, he devastated the temple. How? He sacrificed a pig on the altar that had been dedicated to God, and he erected an altar to Jupiter. In addition, Antiochus, Antiochus prohibited temple worship. He forbade circumcision on the penalty of death. He sold thousands of Jewish families into slavery and destroyed all the copies of scriptures that could be found. Antiochus slaughtered everyone discovered in possession of any copies of the scriptures, which included the scrolls and the manuscripts. And he resorted to every conceivable torture to force the Jews to denounce their religion. The atrocities and persecutions of the Jews under the ruthless regime of Antiochus led to the revolt of the Jews by Judas Maccabus and his brothers. This revolt against the Syrians was one of the most daring feats in history. This period, the Syrian period, was followed by the period of independence. Between 167 and 63 BC, the Jews enjoyed a period of independence. This period has been called the Maccabean or Asmonean or Hasmonean period. A priest by the name of Mathephius, infuriated by the attempt of Antiochus Epiphanes to destroy the Jews and their religion, gathered a band of loyal Jews and revolted against Syrian rule. Mathephius and his band showed intense patriotism and great courage. Mathephius had five heroic and warlike sons. These sons were Judas, Jonathan, uh, Simon, John, and Eliezer. After Mathephius, the mantle fell on his son Judas for leadership of the Jews. Under Judas's leadership, the Jews won many heroic battles against unbelievable odds. And in 1964, Judas Maccabeus reconquered. Five, Jackie. Thank you. In 165 right, BC, Judas Maccabeus reconquered, purified, and rededicated the temple that had been desecrated. This was the origin of the Feast of Dedication. We then had the Roman period, which lasted from 63 BC until the time of Christ. In the year 63 BC, Palestine was conquered by the Romans under Pompey. As a result of this conquest, the Romans appointed Antipater, an Edomite who was a descendant of Esau to rule over Judea. Antipater was succeeded by his son, Herod the Great, who ruled as king of Judea from 37 to 3 BC. In order to obtain favor from the Jews or with the Jews, Herod rebuilt the temple with great fervor. But Herod was a very brutal and cruel man, and it was this Herod who ruled Judea when Jesus was born. And it was this Herod who killed the children of Bethlehem. And if you remember, we go back to Jacob and Esau and that rivalry that began with them in the very womb of their mother. And we see down through the years, even though there was reconciliation between Jacob and Esau, their descendants continued to be at odds against each other. The Old Testament canon uh, is the, the next section that we'll talk about. 
and the word canon came to be used as the name of the list of books which were recognized as the genuine, original inspired, authoritative Word of God. Early in history, God began the formation of the Bible which was to be the medium of his revelation of himself to man. And here is what developed. We find in Deuteronomy 10, 4th and 5th verses, the Ten Commandments were written on stone. Moses' law was written in a book, as we find in the 31st chapter of Deuteronomy, uh, 31, 24 through 26 verses. And in Deuteronomy 17 and 18, copies of this book were made. Then when we get to Joshua 24, 26, we see that Joshua added to the book. Samuel wrote in a book and laid it up before God in 1 Samuel 10, 25. This book was well known 400 years later, as we see documented in 2 Kings 22, verses 8 through 20. We find prophets wrote in a book in Jeremiah 36, 22, in Zechariah 1 and 4, 7, 7, verses 7 through 12. And then we see Ezra reading this book of God publicly in Ezra 7, 6th verse, Nehemiah 8 and 5th verse. In Jesus' day, the Bible was called the Scripture, and it was taught regularly and read publicly in synagogues. It was commonly regarded among the people as the Word of God. Jesus himself repeatedly called it the Word of God. But just when the book, uh, just when the group of the books was completed and set apart as the definitely recognized Word of God, there was still obscurity. The Jews' tradition was that it was done by Ezra. We believe that, as these books were written, beginning with Moses, they were, at the time, recognized as inspired by God and placed in the tabernacle or temple, along with the accumulating group of sacred writings. Copies were made as needed. In the Babylonian captivity, they were scattered, and many copies were destroyed. Ezra, after his return from captivity, reassembled scattered copies and restored them as a complete group to their place in the temple. From temple copies, other copies were made for the synagogues. The synagogues arose in the days of captivity. With the destruction of the temple and the nation scattered, there was a need for places of instruction and worship wherever there were Jewish communities. So after the return from captivity, the Jews continued to use synagogues both in their homeland and in other lands. All large towns had one or more synagogues. In Jerusalem, even though the temple was there, the city had many synagogues. They were presided over by a board of elders or rulers. Early Christian meetings were modeled in part after the pattern of the synagogues. Then we have the dispersion. This is the name given to the Jews who were living outside of Palestine. Very many of them chose to remain in the lands of the captivity. In the intertestament period, Jews outside of Palestine came to be far more numerous than those living in Palestine. There grew to be strong colonies of Jews in every land and in all the chief cities of the civilized world. Then we had um, a division or groups, one of these being the Pharisees. The sect of Pharisees is thought to have originated in the 3rd century BC, in the days preceding the Maccabean Wars, when the Greek denomination, the Greek dom denomination and the Greek effort to Hellenize or make Greek the Jews. There was a strong tendency among the Jews to accept Greek culture with its pagan religious customs. The rise of the Pharisees was a reaction and protest against this tendency among their fellow countrymen. The aim of the Pharisees was to preserve their nation, 
national integrity and strict conformity to Mosaic law. The Pharisees later developed into self-righteous and hypocritical formalists. The Pharisees did not believe in the resurrection from the dead. Hence, they hated the preaching of the apostles. And we know that this was also the group of people who questioned um, Christ during his ministry as to the strict following of the law. But then there was another group, the Sadducees. And this set was thought to have originated about the same time as the Pharisees. They were a group of people whose religious beliefs differed from those that are generally accepted. Being guided by secular considerations, the Sadducees were in favor of adopting Greek customs. They took no part in the Maccabean struggle for their nation's freedom. The Sadducees were a priestly clique. And though they were the religious officials of their nation, they were totally irreligious. The Sadducees were not numerous, but they were wealthy and influential. To a great extent, they controlled the Sanhedrin Council, even though they were irrationalistic and worldly minded. And we know, too, that Christ was brought before the Sanhedrin Council. So what was this Sanhedrin Council? It was the recognized headship of the Jewish people in the days of Jesus Christ. It is believed that the Sanhedrin originated in the third century BC and was composed of 70 members, mostly priests and Sanhedrin nobles, along with some Pharisees, scribes and elders, tribal and family heads. The high priest presided over the Sanhedrin council. And who were the scribes? Who were these scribes? The scribes were considered copyists of the scriptures. To be a scribe was a calling of very early origin. The business of the scribes was to study and interpret, as well as copy the scriptures. Because of their minute acquaintance with the law, they were also called lawyers. And they were the recognized legal authorities, or they were recognized legal authorities. The decisions of the leading scribes became oral law or tradition. They were quite numerous in the Maccabean period, and they became very influential among the people. Being a scribe was a vocation of great importance before the days of printing. So that gives us uh, some background as to what was occurring during the 400 years of silence. But then we have um, the New Testament, and we want to look a little bit at the writers of the New Testament. Let's take a look at these writers of the books of the New Testament in an effort to identify who they were and who wrote each book. Let's keep in mind, however, that there were many anonymous writers. To the best of our ability, we can put together a kind of a chart that's used by many biblical scholars in identifying the writers of the books of the New Testament. The identities of these writers are not etched in stone. The following information that I share is our best guess as to who they were based on the evidence that is available to biblical scholars. First, we'll look at James, who was a Jewish carpenter and also known as the brother of Jesus, and he wrote the book of James. Paul was a Jew and also a Roman citizen by birth, but he was a Jewish defender, tent maker, apostle, and a foreign missionary, and wrote several books, these being Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Romans, Colossians, Ephesians, Philemon, Philippians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Hebrews. Taurus was a Roman secretary of the Apostle Paul, and we say that um, he wrote Romans as Paul's secretary, and we see this in Romans 16th chapter and 22nd verse. 
Then we have Matthew, who is a Jewish publican or tax collector, as well as an apostle, and he wrote the Gospel, Matthew. The Gospel, Luke, um, was written by Luke, as well as Acts, um, and Luke was a, a Greek physician, a scientist, and he was also Paul's travel companion. Peter, who is a Jewish fisherman and an apostle, wrote 1st and 2nd Peter. Mark was a Jew and a Roman citizen. He was also a servant and companion of Peter, Paul, and Barnabas, as well as a foreign missionary, and he wrote the Gospel of Mark. Jude was a Jew and the brother of Jesus, as well as a carpenter and an apostle, and he wrote the book of Jude. John was a Jewish fisherman and an apostle who was believed to be the cousin of Jesus, and he wrote the book of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, as well as Revelation. So when and where were the New Testament books written? I'll give you first the date, the author, and where they were written from. 48 to 62, James wrote James in Jerusalem. 55 through 56, Galatians, written by Paul in Antioch. 50, 1 Thessalonians, written by Paul in Corinth. 50, for, uh, 2 Thessalonians, written by Paul in Corinth. 56, um, 1 and 2 Corinthians, written by Paul. 1 Corinthians in Ephesus and 2 Corinthians, Macedonia. 55 through 60, Mark written by Mark in Rome. 65 through 70, Matthew written by Matthew in Jerusalem. 56, Romans written by Paul in Corinth. 56, Luke written by Luke in Rome. 62, Acts written by Luke in Rome. 61, Colossians, Ephesians, Philemon. Philippians, all written by Paul in Rome. 64, 1 Timothy, written by Paul in Macedonia, as well as Titus, also written by Paul in Macedonia. 62, 1 Peter, written by Peter in Rome. 64 through 66, 2 Peter, written by Peter in Rome. 65 through 60, the book of Jude, uh, written by Jude, and we're not sure where. 67, 2 Timothy, written by Paul, Rome. 68 through 70, Hebrews, written by Paul, unknown. 85, John, written by John in Ephesus. 90, 1 John and 2 John, as well as 3 John, written by John in Ephesus. And then finally, 95, Book of Revelation, written by John from Patmos Island, where he was imprisoned. In closing, this rush of events that we've looked at, these various periods that set the stage for Christ, had a profound impact on the Jewish people. Both Jews and pagans from other nations were becoming dissatisfied with religion. The pagans were beginning to question the validity of polytheism. Romans and Greeks were drawn from their mythologies toward Hebrew scriptures, now easily readable in Greek and Latin. The Jews, however, were despondent. Once again, they were conquered, oppressed, and polluted. Hope was running low. Faith was even lower. They were convinced that now the only thing that could save them in their faith was the appearance of the Messiah. The New Testament tells the story of how hope came not only for the Jews, but for the entire world. Christ's fulfillment of prophecy was anticipated and recognized by many who sought him out. The stories of the Roman centurion, the wise man, and the Pharisee Nicodemus show that Jesus was recognized as the Messiah by those who lived in his day. The 400 years of silence were broken by the greatest story ever told, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's amazing how God utilizes history to work out his, pro his purposes. Though we are living in the days that might be termed the silence of God,
when for almost 2,000 years there has been no inspired voice from God, we must look back even as they did during those 400 silent years upon the inspired record and realize that God has already said all that needs to be said through both the Old and New Testaments. God's purposes have not ended for sure. He is working them out as fully now as he did in those days, just as the world had come to a place of hopelessness then, and the one who would fulfill all their hopes came into their midst so the world that we live in today, where we are again facing a time when despair is spreading widely across the earth, where hopelessness is rampant everywhere, and in this time, God is moving to bring to fulfillment all the prophetic words concerning the coming of his son again into the world to establish his kingdom. We may ask, how long? How close? The answer is, who knows? But what God has done in history, he will do again as we approach the end of the silence of God and his coming again. Amen. Amen. And you may unmute. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise Amen. the Lord. Praise God. Amen. Yes. You're unmuted. You're unmuted. So ask questions or share. Uh, this message has been a blessing to you. Jackie did a great job. She always yes, does. Yes, she did. Yes. Amen. 